It's the lamb we behold who we hear speaking to us today, isn't it? But it's that same lamb we behold who, as we've heard in our readings and as we'll hear in this morning's message, has been forsaken, sacrificed, sent out to the wilderness. That we might have communion with the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One writer, followed by many others, say that these are the most difficult of all words of Scripture to interpret. We've just heard some words and heard an interpretation of them. Spirit given. And so for us to hear these words of Christ on the cross and to interpret, to understand, to plumb the depths of their meaning, we need all the power and revelation of the Spirit. These words do hold a mystery for us, a wonderful mystery, a wonderful revelation actually of God's holy love in action. In these words we can begin to fathom what it is and what it meant for John the Baptist to declare as we've just sung, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we can begin to fathom what it really means when we say, Jesus died for me. One of our girls, our youngest, asked during the week, what's a cliché? There's some words that are often used in a cliché way, aren't they? Jesus died for me. Trite, overused. This morning there's no cliché. On the cross there was no cliché. For Jesus to die for you and me meant he had to be forsaken. before we expound more fully what's going on here on the cross in this fourth word as part of our series on the word and words of the cross. There are some questions I want us to consider. Three questions. The first one we need to ask, or at least the one I asked when praying and considering this word, was why does Jesus cry this cry? Is he simply quoting from Psalm 22? had that on his mind, it was fresh. And I don't think so. Some would say there's no way he could be actually forsaken. That would be divine child abuse. But even as Christ quotes from Psalm 22, that he does do that, but what he's doing is fulfilling more than just quoting a scripture. Why does he cry this cry? Because he was forsaken. He didn't just feel lonely or simply feel like he was forsaken, he was forsaken. So the next question to ask is why is Jesus, the holy and righteous one, forsaken? Why did, why does God forsake him here on the cross? Might sound too obvious a question but it's good to raise. God is holy. Dwells in the high and lofty places yet brings himself to us and dwells among sinners. But the Holy One cannot commune with sin. And so here upon the cross, Jesus, as he bears the sin of the world, as he has become sin for us, has become a curse, God in all his holiness, cannot commune with sin. Sin cannot cohabit with God. And sin cannot bear up to his holiness without being burnt up. Never before had God forsaken his people to this extent. Despite such action being warranted right throughout history. Even his very judgments, you read the book of Hosea and he says, you were once my people, now you're not my people. You once received mercy, now you no longer receive mercy. But that gets turned around. The very judgments of God against and upon his people tells us that he was present, that he hadn't forsaken them, that he was fulfilling the very promises of his covenant. Christ 
Christ, oh God, was near his people, even in judgment, so near that his hand could strike them. But here on the cross, that which he put off for so long in his divine forbearance, as Paul talks about in Romans 3, what he has put off finally comes to fruition. The sword of the Lord has been awakened and now strikes his own shepherd, his suffering servant, his son. And out of the darkness, after three hours, where not even creation could bear to see his face, nor allow others to see it. Isaiah 52 tells us, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. And out of that darkness comes the cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that cry we see the enormity of our sin, of all sin. We see the weight of judgment that it deserves and we see all of God's holiness and what it demands upon a sinner. But it's upon Jesus. So what does this cry then mean for us? Not just the cry, not the words, but the forsakenness itself. Romans 8 gives us a pretty good summary of it. The bookends of Romans 8. Because of that cry, because Jesus was forsaken, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. God's wrath and his judgment upon sin is exhausted here upon Jesus. So there's now no condemnation for those who trust in him. And it also means, as the end of Romans 8 says, there is now no separation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Christ was separated, that for us there might be now no separation. God has done what the law, Paul says, weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh, in his son, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. In us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. The righteous requirement of the law met in us. The wages of sin is death. That righteous requirement has been fully met in Christ and we've been crucified with Christ so that we no longer live but Christ lives in us so that the righteous requirement of the law has been fully met in us. The other side of that righteous requirement of the law is the pure and perfect obedience, the faith and trust in God. It's what the law requires, it's what God's holiness demands. And that requirement has been fully met in Christ, in his life, in his obedience to death, even death on a cross. And as we've been crucified with him, we now live in him and his righteousness has been counted to us so that that righteous requirement of the law has been fully met in us. So now there's no condemnation and no separation from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What does it mean for us that Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does it mean that Jesus himself was forsaken by God? It means that you and I might never, ever need be forsaken. If you hear anything this morning, hear that. God in his word, in his grace and in his revelation to us in the scriptures, he makes little of the cost of his love for us. Little of the cost and much of the benefit and the blessings that we receive. We speak of God's unconditional love and his grace as his free gift to us, undeserved, and it costs us nothing. But it's not cheap. There's no such thing as cheap grace. It cost him his own dear son, whom he gave up as a ransom. He gave so that whoever believes in him should have life, eternal and abundant. 
And here in this word on the cross, yes, a quote from Psalm 22, but far more than that, in this cry we get just a momentary glimpse of what it cost God and what it cost Jesus. He doesn't want us to dwell on that cost. But this morning, this cry is the theme for us to consider. As one writer, his name is Arthur Pink, interesting name, I'm sure he would have got a few payouts at school. But he says this, I think he was a justified man, so the payouts wouldn't have mattered all that much. Though these words are of startling import, appalling woe and deepest mystery, unique pathos, unique suffering, profound solemnity, yet we are not left in ignorance as to their meaning. True, this cry was deeply mysterious, yet it is capable of the most blessed solution. The Holy Scriptures leave it impossible to doubt that these words of unequalled grief were both the fullest manifestation of divine love and the most awesome inspiring display of God's inflexible justice. God's love and justice being displayed at full pitch. God's holy love and holy wrath being worked together, the wrath of his love that he might demonstrate his love to us and his grace to all creation, to all sinful humanity. And as he judges, judges the sin of the world in Jesus, he conveys his holiness and justice to their utmost, but at the same time he conveys his grace and love in all their fullness. That he, that God might be both the just and the one who justifies. He is just because sin cannot and is not merely forgotten about or ignored or given a slap on the wrist but is thoroughly dealt with as his holiness and his law demands, his wrath exhausted upon this man, his man, his servant, his son upon the cross. He is just and he is the one who justified, justifies because in the same action as our sin is borne by Jesus on the cross, as his righteousness is imputed to those who believe, we are declared righteous in his sight. We are justified. As Jesus becomes a curse for us, we become children of God with whom he is well pleased on account of his son. And it's God's action. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Just as he wonderfully and graciously provided for Adam and Eve as they were banished from the garden, what had they done in their sin and their shame? They'd made fig leaves to cover themselves, to try to hide their sin and their shame, hiding amongst the trees and the rocks. We'd never try to do that, would we? Try to cover up our sin and our shame with futile efforts, try to please God with our own attempts to try to atone for our own stuff-ups and rebellion, as if sin was just a list of misdemeanours that we've just got to make sure we get the balance of good over bad and it will pay, be paid off in the end. Can't work like that. Your conscience tells you it can't work like that. No effort of ours, no good deeds, not even a sacrifice of ours, even that which God provided in the old covenant, given by him, none of it could cleanse the conscience. Instead, God provides the cover. He made Adam and Eve clothes. They tried to make fig leaves. He makes them clothes out of what? Out of animal skins. God made the sacrifice that their sin and their shame would be covered. And here upon the cross, God makes the sacrifice, not just that it might be covered over, but that it's covered. Like when you go out for a meal and you're with a friend and they say, that's all right, I've got it covered. It's paid for. It's dealt with. It's expiated. Not by us, but by God through his Son. And we enjoy and reap the benefits. And God gets the glory. Part of the wonder and mystery and the glory of the cross 
even in this cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is that God actually enjoys the benefits of it as well. If that doesn't make sense, just let it not make sense because it's how it is. This is for God's glory. Jesus prayed, glorify me with the glory you had and he's talking about the cross. Even in this cry, Jesus ultimately enjoys the benefits. But at this point in time, at the moment of this cry, after three hours of darkness, there's little joy. There's little awareness. Actually, there's no joy. There is no awareness, no conscious awareness of communion with the Father and the Son. The only awareness Jesus has at this point is of darkness and sin bearing down upon him, weighing heavily, heavier than it has upon any human being because none of us, bar Adam, have known pure and undefiled communion with the Father before. But here that communion, that presence, that being with God is absent. And here under terrible, thick darkness, Jesus is aware of nothing but that darkness. Not just three hours of physical darkness. John said last week he doesn't like to make much of Christ's physical sufferings, that is not to overplay them and try to manipulate our emotions with them and rightly so because Christ's sufferings, the physical sufferings were this compared to what we hear this morning. The relational, spiritual, emotional sufferings of being forsaken by God where darkness is Jesus' only companion. Psalm 88, they say, is one of the darkest psalms or the most depressing psalm. It's a lament, but all the other laments in the psalms have got a happy ending, so to speak. They all turn to God and look to him as the good one, the one who loves, the one who will restore his people. Psalm 88 doesn't have that. Good thing is we've got Psalm 89 straight after it. But listen to Psalm 88. Open up if you want to read on. O Lord God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more. For they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, I cry to you in the morning. My prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Or possibly the Hebrew says darkness has become my only companion. Here on the cross, darkness is Christ's only companion. No wonder he provided for his mother and the disciple whom he loved with a word we heard last week. That they would have a companion throughout the darkness. But now his only companion is darkness. And out of that he cries 
Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Most of us would know that once Jesus yielded up his spirit and breathed his last, we stopped short in the Luke reading. Sorry about that, we possibly could have kept going. But the temple curtain was torn in two. And it's often said, and rightly so, that that event symbolises our access, direct and full access to God, our Holy Father. But for that access to the Holy of Holies to be given and gained, the curtain had to be torn apart. And for access to the Holy Father to be given and gained, a relationship of pure, unadulterated, undefiled, perfect, holy communion had to be torn apart, like the curtain was, as Jesus is forsaken upon the cross. That tearing, the opening, is the same word used for what the heavens did at Jesus' baptism. Jesus came out of the water, he saw the heavens opening, being rent apart and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And at that moment a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Blessed, dear communion, acceptance, affirmation and love. But here on the cross at this baptism, Jesus spoke of the cross as another baptism to go through. Instead of coming up out of the water, he's plunged into deep and utter darkness. Instead of the spirit descending on him like a dove, the sin of the world is laid upon him and the wrath of God descends upon him. And instead of hearing a voice from heaven, he hears nothing. Nothing for three long hours of darkness. And we hear nothing. Nothing for three hours until we hear that cry of dereliction, of total abandonment. And instead of hearing of divine approval and pleasure in him, instead of blessed dear communion, he's abandoned, utterly forsaken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now I know even amongst some of us here there's been questions and discussions in the past as to whether or not God the Father forsook the Son or is this God forsaking the man, Jesus? Some have even changed words of songs because of that dilemma and that conundrum. And I can understand the dilemma a whole understanding of the Godhead, of the Trinity, that would be that they are one, that they're inseparable. But at the same same time, so is Jesus' humanity and his deity. He is fully God and fully man, inseparable. But why doesn't he cry, O Father, O Father, why have you forsaken me? Well, he was dying as man for men. So he's crying out as man for men. But... If, as the Son, at this point in his suffering, as Jesus is on the cross, being forsaken by God, if, as the Son, he has some divine understanding or communion with the Father that we don't see, that we don't know about, if he somehow knew that God the Father hadn't really forsaken him, that it was really all okay, this was just a show for everyone else, then he has not suffered to the full. And if he has not suffered to the full, then he has not exhausted God's wrath on the cross which means there's still something of us to bear for our sin. But that is not the case. He has suffered to the full. God's wrath has been exhausted and there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The theologians, when they talk about God's atonement and propitiation, they speak about God's wrath being appeased here at the cross. But God's wrath is not only appeased in the way that we would use that word. God's not just bought off for a time and says, well, wait till next time. God's wrath is utterly exhausted upon the Son at the cross. Is there still a wrath to come? Well, yes, when Christ appears again, we speak of that day of wrath, but at the same time, no. 
We all know John 3.16, but do we know the next couple of verses? God did not send his son into the world. This is verse 17. I'll go back to 16 for our memories. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son in, into the world in order to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Here on the cross, God's judgment and final decree upon all humanity is being worked out. He's come that we might have life and have it abundant and full. Believe in him and you will be saved. Not believe in him and you stand condemned already because you do not believe in the Son of God. I don't think we can comprehend it fully whether the Father forsook the Son or God forsook Jesus and how that all works out just like we can't comprehend the incarnation that God comes to earth as a man, as a baby. God wasn't in heaven sort of two thirds the Trinity up there and one third here on earth, was he? The Trinity is not incomplete here at the cross. Actually, they're all in the one action together, Father, Son and Spirit. At a bare minimum, we have to say that Jesus as man for men was utterly forsaken by God and therefore as the Son of the Father at this point, he did not know the Father's presence or else we as the sons of God on account of Christ as children of the Father cannot be wholly reconciled to him. Jesus himself said that there are some things the Father knows that the Son doesn't. For example, the particular day and hour that the Son of Man is going to come again. That's not anti-Trinitarian. That's just how the Father and the Son and the Spirit work together. In family, in communion. It's how the Father's the Father and the Son's the Son. Again from Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Jesus the Son has suffered to the full, that we might have full access and be in full communion with the Father through the Son. We can live, we do live, every day in full communion with the Father. We cannot escape his presence, the scriptures tell us. From the fall in the garden to this day, humanity has been separated from God, but only to a certain degree. God's been ever present, but never fully present because of sin. Humanity could not ever be in full communion with God because of sin. But this changes that. The sending out of the garden, the flaming sword at the entrance of Eden, the curtain in the temple, the holy of holies, they all witness to the fact that sin separates us from God. But no more. Because of this cry, because of this abandonment, because of this separation, we now have access how does Paul put it in Ephesians? Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He speaks of the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, broken down. But not just that wall, so too, as we heard, is the curtain in the temple so that through him, through Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, all people might have access in one spirit to the Father. Not that we can barge into heaven because we've got access but because the Father accepts us and invites us and adopts us into his family on the basis of Christ. Our access is given to us, granted to us by the Father himself. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus went out to the wilderness. 
in the power of the Spirit and here at the end of his earthly ministry he sent away to the wilderness again like the goat on the day of the atonement. This time though he is utterly alone bearing the sin of the world. It's a mix of metaphors I know but here Jesus is the Lamb of God but he's the goat that is sent out into the wilderness on the day of atonement. On that day one goat is sacrificed by the, holy, the, the high priest and its blood shed and sprinkled upon everything unclean to make atonement for them. And then God's own hands here are laid upon the live goat, upon Jesus himself. And all the iniquities, all the transgression, all the sin of the people are born upon him. And he's sent away into the wilderness, abandoned up to the desert, which is where your sin and mine is now. Far, far away. Never to be remembered, never to return as far as east is from the west. David wrote in one psalm, I have been young and I, now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken. But here it is, the holy and righteous one forsaken. And in John 10, Jesus himself says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. That love, that laying down of his life, meant this abandonment. In some, again, profound, mysterious way, never before had Jesus been so far from God, yet never before was the Father more pleased with the Son. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, Jesus says, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own authority. I speak just as the Father taught me and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. But here the thing that is pleasing to him but most painful is to leave him alone. What were God's words to Adam in the garden after he'd eaten of the fruit? First words, where are you? Can we see the irony of Christ's cry? Not so much the irony but the, the absolute dereliction and the unleashing of all that God had stored up in his divine forbearance. Jesus himself all his life being one with the Father now asking him, where are you? Why have you left me? We turned our faces away from God well before God ever turned his face away from our sin. In the garden, Jeremiah 2, my people have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. Just last Thursday, I attended a funeral of a young lad who had died in a car accident. He was an old scholar of mine and I taught his family, his three sisters. 18 years old, tragically killed in a car accident. A chasm had come between this young man and his family and friends. The deep, very long, vast chasm of death. The Salvation Army Hall in town was packed, standing room only and so were the rooms outside. And his parents and his three sisters stood at the front of the congregation only an arm's breadth from the casket, about from me here to the communion table there. So close, but the whole chasm of death between them. But do you know what? Whilst there were many tears in those days and on that day, they never once reached out to that casket trying to cross that chasm, trying to pull their son and their brother back, trying to cling to something that was no longer there. Instead, as we sang from the beginning of that service to the end, they had their arms raised, not with fists on the other end, shaking them at God, 
but hands open, lifted in praise to God. And they were singing at the top of their lungs and the whole family were singers. How great is our God. How great thou art. It is well with my soul. Thank you, O our Father, for giving us your Son. How could they sing that? How could they lift their hands in praise? Why? Because they knew something. They knew that Jesus had been forsaken so that their boy, their son, their brother, who knew it also, though he might die, would not see death. That he would not come into judgment but had passed from death to life. their pastor got up and said to the family, we've been trying to comfort you this week and encourage you, but you have done that for us. They entrusted themselves and the one they lost to the faithful creator and to the one who had been forsaken. To say Jesus died for me is no cliche, is it? It's the truth. But to say it is to say that Jesus was forsaken that day for me, that I might never be forsaken, that we too might lift up our hands and our hearts in joy and praise, even in the face of death, because it no longer has any sting. I haven't referred to Psalm 22, which Jesus is quoting. But it shouldn't surprise you, mathematically at least, that Psalm 22 comes directly before Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Winston's friend Spurgeon noted this. And he said, There are no green pastures, there are no still waters on the other side of Psalm 22. It's only after we've read, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we come to, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It's only after Jesus is forsaken and because he was forsaken that we can enjoy full, sweet communion with the Father. And we can and we do. If you don't, then I pray this morning. Hear this word. Not just this word, but the word of the cross that says your sins are forgiven. Come to me. Your sins no longer need to be a barrier between you and me. Because Jesus was abandoned. Don't carry the burden of your sin any longer. Repent, believe, receive full forgiveness. And together with us all, Enjoy full communion with the Father. Let's pray. Father, what love, what holy love. But also, Father, in the midst of that holy love, what horrible, dark, depths our sin goes to. But Father, that chasm has been bridged by Christ. That we may come to you confident and bold, not because of anything we've done, but because you invite us and have granted access to us through your Son. We cannot, Father, begin to imagine what it was for him to know that forsakenness and to cry that cry. But, Father, stop us from trying to work that out. Instead, Father, draw us close that we might look to you as the one who loves us so much so that you gave your Son for us. that we might enjoy the fruit and the blessings 
and the benefits of what it has cost you. But Father, that cost in one sense is no cost because of your love. Because for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross, despising the shame. Father, we thank you for giving us your Son and leaving us your Spirit till your work on earth be done. Amen.